If you're struggling in the math section of the SAT, this video is going to cover five tips you can implement today to get a higher score. My first tip is to use Desmos when it's faster for you. With systems of equations, a lot of the time, we're gonna recommend using Desmos because it goes quickly. For this one, for example, all we have to do is plug these equations in and look for our answer. It's asking us for the value of y in the system of equations. So I've already plugged them in, but you know, how long does it take? Negative x plus three <laughs> plus y equals negative 3.5, x plus 3, y equals 9.5. So it takes a few seconds. Um, I was going pretty slow, too. If you get faster at this, you can definitely knock these out really quickly. And then you just go to your solution, and it's asking for y, which is the second number, right? So we know our answer is 1.5. So maybe that's a quick route for you. But if you look at this, and you're familiar with using elimination, you can see that it's already set up for elimination because essentially you want to add your equations together and usually you have to multiply one of the equations so that you eliminate your x or you eliminate your y. But here, if we add them together as they are, we get x, negative x plus x is nothing, so x disappears. Um, I'm actually going to move over here. y plus 3y is 4y. 9.5 minus 3.5 is simply going to be 6, and then divide by 4. So we get 6 over 4, aka 3 over 2. And 3 over 2 is an acceptable answer, but that's also the same as 1.5, right? So we can get our answer that way, maybe even faster, depending on how comfortable you are. So again, the tip is use Desmos when it's faster for you. It's really going to depend on what sort of tricks you know outside of that calculator. My next tip is to look for shortcuts while you're practicing. You want to get into the habit of finding shortcuts during practice so that when you get down to taking the actual exam, you are already comfortable and you can do it without thinking. So take a look at this question and see if you can spot any shortcuts before I give you the solution. And definitely pause the video because I'm going to give you the solution right now with the shortcut that I found. Basically, we are trying to find a possible value of x plus 5. So somehow we need to change this mess so that something equals x plus 5. That's the route that I would go anyway. There's the option of solving for x first, but why would you do that when you can try to solve for x plus 5? First thing that I would do, shortcut-wise, is my little, uh, I call it the fraction switcheroo. And this is when you have a fraction. Let's say we have the fraction uh, 1 over 2. Actually, no, let's change it. Let's say we have the fraction 2 over 1. Would you agree that that is equal to the number 2? You would. So the trick is you can take a whole number and you can switch that whole number with the denominator of a fraction that it's equal to. So if I switched these, we would get 2 over 2 equals 1, which is also true. So that's how the switcheroo works. If you have an equation, a whole number can switch places with the denominator of a fraction. If we apply that to this, we switch the 4 out for all that madness. Uh, let me write it over here. And then we get x squared plus 10x plus 25 equals 1 over 4. I don't know about you, but that's looking a heck of a lot cleaner to me already. Uh, now, how are we going to get x plus 5? Well, we've got a quadratic on the left side of the equation here, so let's factor it. And remember, when we factor, we're looking for two numbers that add up to this value next to x and two numbers that multiply to this value at the end. You can always remember your your base formula is ax squared plus bx plus c. So you're trying to add up to the b value, multiply to the c value. Anyway, let's do that. So two numbers that add up to 10, 5 and 5 add up to 10, and 5 times 5 is 25. So this would simply become x plus 5 times x plus 
5, and that equals 1 fourth, right? So this is looking a little tricky because we want to get x plus 5 by itself, which means we would have to divide by x plus 5, right? But then on the right side, we would have to divide by x plus 5, and we'd, we'd still be in trouble. So what we can do is we can say, well, x plus 5 times x plus 5 is the same thing as x plus 5 squared. And now we don't have to divide by x plus 5. We can just say we're going to take the square root. So let's take the square root of that side and the square root of this side. And then on the right side, remember, when you square root a fraction, you're basically just square rooting the numerator and the denominator. So what's the square root of 1? 1. What's the square root of 4? 2. Our answer is 1 half. Let's look at another example. Again, see if you can find the shortcut for this. Pause the video. All right, so we have an equation, and then we have an expression. And we're trying to get the value of this expression based off of this equation. My recommendation is that you try to find common ground. That is, try to get that first equation to look more like the second equation, or in this case, the second expression, right? What do I notice? Well, we're going from 18x, negative 18x, to negative 6x. What's the relationship there? Let's think about it. What's 6 times 3? 18. So what would happen if we divided the entire equation by 3? Let's see. We have 3x squared minus 18x minus 15. 3 divided by 3 is 1, so we get x squared. Change my color here. We just discussed 18 divided by 3 is 6 and 15 divided by 3 is 5, right? So we're getting closer. We need x squared minus 6x, right? But we have x squared minus 6x minus 5. Well, that's easy enough. We've got to get rid of that 5. So let's add 5 to both sides, and we get x squared minus 6x equals 5. And by golly, that's what they wanted to know. So that's our answer. Tip number three is to know linear equations like the back of your hand. The reason I say this is that 25% of the math questions in the College Board Question Bank are linear. And the College Board Question Bank is meant to reflect the actual exams. So by being confident and comfortable with linear equations, you are potentially knocking out a quarter of the questions so you can focus on the rest of the exam. Let's take a look at this question here. Just as before, go ahead and pause the video, see if you could solve it on your own first. And the first thing I would say is, how do I know this is linear? Well, with linear equations in the form of a word problem, we're looking for a couple of things. We're looking for a starting point, which is going to be our y-intercept, right? And we are looking for a constant rate of change, which should be our slope. The reason I immediately recognize this as linear is that I see 24 bushels when Hector began to use the auger. This is a starting point. So we already know we have y equals mx plus 2400, right? Or sorry, 24,000, I should say. After five hours of using the auger, 19... 1,350 bushels of corn remained. So we don't know what the constant rate of change is. They didn't tell us what the slope is. They didn't tell us how many bushels of corn Hector's working through in an hour. But they did give us some stats, right? We know that we basically have two points. We have 0, 24,000, because 0 would be 0 hours, right? So that's our x. And then we have 5. They said at 5 hours, there were 19,350 bushels of corn. So what do you do if you have two points and you want the slope? Well, you use the slope formula. You might recognize this as y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And the two y's and the two x's are just you know, the given points, right? So if we use the points we have here, we would get 24,000. And I'm just choosing that number first because it's bigger and I don't want a negative number because I don't feel like it. Minus 19,350 divided by, of course, now we'll get negative regardless, zero minus five. I'm running out of room, so I'm going to go over this direction if that's all right. So I 
threw that into the calculator and we get basically negative 4650 over five, which is equal to negative 930. All right, so all that done, now we've got our equation. We have y equals negative 930x plus 24,000. And all we have to do is plug in 12,840 into our y, and we'll get our answer. I'm erasing this, but go ahead and rewind if you need to. Subtract 24,000. Oops, forgot my, my negative sign there. Should be negative 930x. I'm gonna move over here again. So we get negative 11,160 equals negative 930x. These can both be turned positive to make things a little bit easier. And then we just have to divide by 930, right? And just like that, we get 12 equals x. So our answer is D, 12. Tip number four is to use the geometry cheat sheet. I'm talking about that little reference button up in the upper right corner. It is going to contain a bunch of common geometry formulas, and it can really help you if you forget one. Take this question, for example. Take a look at it. See if you can solve it on your own first. But yeah, let's say we have no idea. We don't know what the volume for a circular cylinder is. How are we supposed to do this? Well, you click on that little button and you're gonna see this reference sheet that pops up, right? And where is our circular cylinder? Well, hopefully you know what a circular cylinder looks like. You do need to know that much. It's basically a Pringles can, or in this case, uh, this little guy right here. So it looks like volume is pi r squared times height, which makes sense, right? Because You've got a circle which is pi r squared and then you're just adding height to that circle to make a circular cylinder so first thing i would do is literally just write down the formula volume equals pi r squared times height and then plug in what we know it has a volume of 45 pi so we're going to change v to 45 pi the height of the cylinder is 5 so we're going to change h to 5 what is the radius of the cylinder? So all we have to do is solve for r. Let's do it. Now, speaking of shortcuts, we could take care of this pretty quickly by dividing by five pi all at once because we want to get rid of the pi and we want to get rid of the five, right? So you could totally divide by pi, then divide by five, but let's just, let's just see what it looks like if we do it all at once. Our pi's would disappear, and then 45 divided by 5 is 9. So we get 9 equals r squared. Take the square root of both of those. And then r equals 3, right? Because 9, the square root of 9 is 3. So our answer is A. That cheat sheet is super helpful. But my last tip is actually to memorize vital formulas that are not included on that cheat sheet. These are normally going to be non-geometry formulas. I'm talking about things like negative b over 2a, the quadratic formula, uh, the mean formula. Anything like this is really good to have memorized. Or something like how to add percent. In this question, for example, we're being asked to add 20% to 60, right? What number is 20% greater than 60? So pause the video, go ahead and see if you can solve this. And when I solve it, I like to use a shortcut. Some students might take 60 and multiply by 0.2 and then add that, right? But I'm gonna say, what's 60 times 1.2? What's the logic here? This one is our original 100%, and then this 0.2 is the additional 20%. So we are adding 20%. We could throw this into the calculator, or we could say 6 times 12 is 72. Where did I get 6 times 12? Well, there's something cool you can do. You can mess with, uh, when you're multiplying numbers, you can mess with decimal points and zeros. Basically, if I move this decimal point over, I have to move this decimal point over to make up for it. So we get 6 times 12, which is 72. And then our answer, very easily, is 72. Now that last tip is definitely going to take some time and some practice, but you can get started right now with this video on percentages. It covers four concepts that you need to know specifically for percentages on the SAT.